Sono solo? Hello? Ciao. Non c'è... Buongiorno Peppe. Ciao Giuseppe. Ciao a tutti. Io ti ho dato. Buongiorno. Buonasera. Buongiorno. Non vedo l'ospite però. E a tutti. Sebastian, non ti ho ricordato. Sebastian. C'è, arriva. È arrivato? Sì, sì. Sebastian? Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Ah, hello Sebastian. Hi Sebastian. Hello George. Hello Sebastian. There are some... Uh, I extended the, the invitation also to the DTT physics list. Here you can see some of my students because we are... Um, in hybrid modality. So this means that uh, part of the guys are uh, connected remotely by home and part of the guys are uh, here. And uh, thanks for, for coming uh, to be our guest today. Uh, I'd like uh, to start immediately. Uh, so and I introduce uh, one of my best friends in fusion is Sebastian Brzezinski. Is uh, I think uh, one of the most important physicists in the world in Europe on the fusion <laughs> nuclear materials. I spend a beautiful time when uh, we move from a carbon wall to deeper light wall. I mean uh, the first wall in beryllium and uh, the tens and the mercury in jet. Spending uh, a lot of uh, sessions together when uh, we pass the, the new heater light -like wall. So um, I asked uh, Sebastian uh, to give this uh, lecture to my students because we are a course of mechanical engineering and the PhD uh, also in the mechanical engineering. So we have an overview on uh, this new work package of the plasma uh, wall interaction and exhaust uh, with the focus on uh, Please, Sebastian, you can share your screen. Yeah, thank you for this nice words. I have to say that I have not only uh, focused on this new work package and it is more for students. So yeah. I'm not sure if uh, the Italian colleagues from uh, DTT are so interested. It's more like an overview of uh, PWI and what are open questions at the end. Um, let me share my screen. So you have the you have the full screen? No, no, it's okay. We can see you. So just uh, uh, we uh, I would like uh, to ask you if we can uh, record the lecture because there are some students that uh, that will join later. Uh, sure, sure. Okay, thanks a lot. So I have changed a little bit the title. It's not only on PWIE because this is all still a little bit in progress. Um, uh, could you, could you mute your microphone, Giuseppe? Because it's so echoing, thank you. So I have uh, changed a little bit of title. It's in the introduction into the diverter physics and plasma surface interaction in nuclear fusion. And uh, what I will speak about is in principle focused on, on ITER and there will be at the end some demo aspects. You see here a picture of ITER and the typical size of a scientist. Uh, at the bottom, you see it's a huge machine, six, uh, meter diameter from here to here. And this is the scientist. And I will speak mainly about that part here, which is the diverter. So I have a short, I have a general introduction, which is really basic, but I will show you that this has some links to really fundamental question when we look into PWI. Then I will speak about the tokamak as such, how it works and what are the challenges. And I will try to explain why uh, the decision was made to look for tungsten as a diverter material. I will also explain why beryllium is used. Then I will go into the diverter physics a little bit again from the textbook. What are the different functionalities and how this works? And then depending, we may here do a break and then I will speak about plasma wall interaction. In general, what is the critical erosion which you have of materials? 
and then uh, related to uh, retention, which is one of the key question. If you want to have a reactor operating that you should not have fuel stored, you have to fulfill the fuel cycle. And then I will just briefly show uh, what remains for ITER to be done from my perspective. And then a couple of words, which are the bigger challenges for demo. Now, as you know, I think that's very basic. It's just that you know that we are trying to follow the DT reaction, which has the highest cross section. You see it here at about 10 to 100 kV. Here's the optimum range. And this reaction has the highest uh, um, cross section and you will produce the neutrons, which have uh, the major part of the energy and an alpha particles, which is the helium ash. And of course, we want to exploit this energy in the wall later in a reactor to transfer this into electricity via uh, several steps. So what is the magic? You need to have about 50-50 deuterium tritium, and then you have to fulfill some conditions which are typically known, you see in the lectures, a triple product. So you have to have a combination of the ions which are colliding, so tritons and deuterons at the right temperature, which you see here, and they have to have enough time to do this reaction. And if you take these numbers, calculate, you see you need something like five times 10 to the 21 kilo electron volts per second per cubic meter. And then you can start to think about the reactor. Now, of course, these are numbers. This is the core conditions. And we will speak vaguely about the edge. So what you have to do is, of course, you have to provide this in the core to these very high temperatures. But what you're starting is as a pellet, typically, or gas. It's a deuterium tritium gas or a deuterium tritium ice pellet which has to pass the cold edge plasma and then come into the core and then it has to fill up the density. And then to have this, if you have EV in the edge and 10 kV in the core, you have to have very large gradients, gradients in temperature and the density and the product is the pressure. And on the other hand, if you have produced the helium, the helium should not stay in the core. Otherwise you would have dilution and you cannot continue with oper your operation. So this helium has to be exhausted faster than the confinement time in principle and has to be ex uh, released out of the con uh, um, confined plasma. This will be done via the diverter and where it is then extracted out. Um, so that's a very critical question and of course needs to be tested. Now, you know, all this is done by a magnetic cage. So you have a magnetized plasma and you have the Lorentz force here, which takes action. And then you have the ions and electrons, which gyrate over the magnetic field, which you have with the duration radius here, very important. It depends on the mass. Later, I will explain you, this is a very critical, very simple question, but very critical if you work with tungsten, this uh, uh, mass depends here. So this is what you have to do. And of course you have certain magnetic fields and typically our magnetic fields in fusion devices are two, four, six, eight uh, Tesla. This is typically what you will have. And so this is a fully, uh, uh, fully, fully magnetized plasma. In linear machines for testing, usually it's weaker and this is just described by this parameter. Now, the principal idea was initially to have this uh, in a linear slab geometry, very simple. There would be not cross fusion uh, transport uh, here, no cross field transport. Everything would be stay inside perfectly. No PWI in principle and uh, all would be fine. As you know, this doesn't work. You try to close it and then you have this uh, typical torus. But even this torus as a torus with only one magnetic field component is not working. Why it's not working? because you have different mechanisms which drives the particles out of the confined region. One is that you have particle drifts because your ma magnetic field is inhomogeneous. You have a D one over R depends of the magnetic field. So the core it's uh, highest and then it decays. And so you have a gradient. And if you have the gradient in principle, then you start to have charge separation. Then you use an electric field and then you have an electric field cross the magnetic field in that direction, which gives you the E cross B, and this moves the particles out, and then you have an instable condition. So you have to do more than just to have a torus uh, inside. So this is uh, the drift which you have. Um, it's a curvature drift and the gradient B drift. Together, this is called the torus drift. And now to make it stable, you have to make this very nice arrangement of a helical structure. So you need a second magnetic field component, not only one inside, but also one in that direction, which is a poloidal. And there are two options, the stellarator and the tokamak. 
And this is the typical picture you get for the, uh, the tokamak. You have the very big gradient pressure, which needs to be then balanced by J cross B. B is the magnetic field. And then if you have these, uh, then of course you have these uh, uh, structures. So what you have in, in addition to get these poloidal uh, component, you need to have here transformator joke. You induce a plasma current in that direction. It creates inductive uh, magnetic field in this direction and the green and this green are then creating the black one and then you have your perfectly confined plasma. In reality, everything is much more complex and you will end up that there's a lot of turbulence and if you have turbulence, then you have further transport out and this is why we don't have a reactor in the moment, but we have to make the machines bigger. We have just to have the isolation better. Now, if you're pointing yourself on a field line and you follow the field line, then this field line sees these different magnetic fields. As I said, it's one over R, and you see it's going up and down, sees different curvatures, and this is typically how it follows up. You make something like three to five turns before you come roughly to the same position. So that's again the uh, ar arrangement. As I said, this is a tokamak. You need this inductively driven toroidal plasma current, and so you need always a plasma required to have the confinement perfect, which is actually at the end a drawback because this only works if it is pulsed or you have a dB over dt change. The other solution, I will not speak about this, but if you have a question, I can do this, is an arrangement where you have the magnetic field coils arranged in that range here, which provides you directly a helical structure. This is an uh, arrangement how you can do this with normal coils. I'm also working at W7X. The coils look much more complicated, but the plasma looks very similar like this one, not so nice like a donut, but more like a twist. And in this case, everything is done just simply by the magnetic field. And you have this complex diverter geometry 3D structure. Here, everything is more like 2D symmetric. And just to show you how different it looks, if you look in the machine, I will speak now mainly about this machine, which is JET. This machine has from here to here about three meters. That's the main chamber, you see it here. That's the diverter. And you see an impingent footprint of the plasma. Um, you see everything very nice symmetric. And if you look into a stellarator, that's a picture inside of LHD, one of the two large stellarators in the world. It's a torsatron. Then you see actually very strange shape because here behind are the magnetic field coils. And what you see here is the diverter. It's this one. See how strange shaped it is and very complex, and here the diverter is very simple. On the other end, this arrangement is perfect. It's steady state. You don't need to have, if you have superconducting coils, you don't need to think about other stuff. You could just switch them on. You have your confinement, and you put your particles in, then start the plasma, and then you have your steady state plasma in principle. Here, usually, you have to do more. You have to do uh, dB over dt, and then you have to do current drive to make this steady state in a reactor, not in jet. Jet is a pulse machine, nothing is actively cooled. It's only a couple of seconds plus about 20 seconds or so. So this was the introduction. Now I will speak in more detail about the tokamak, another nice picture from ITER. You see here again, the structure. These are these toroidal field coils that you have the toros as you know, and here's the nice diverter. In this case, everything is superconducting and you have this very big cryostat to make this long pulse. In JET, it's a little bit different. It's also a different arrangement. You see this one has, I think, 16 coils, toroidal, and this one has uh, 32 coils, uh, 24 coils. You see them here. Very nice in JET, very narrow, which makes the magnetic field very perfect. So there's not really a ripple, so a variation from coil to coil, which makes it a very nice machine to study. Um, you have then, in addition, these coils here, which have been added later on. These are the diverter coils. And what they are doing is out of this simple circular plasma I showed you before, they make this diverted plasma diverted here with the X point, with the interaction into the diverter area, where you have the major exhaust of particles and the core plasma is where you would like to have the fusion. This is done by these coils. Now, if you make a design and a reactor, you would never do it like this because the most expensive are these very big coils and you would try to make these coils outside to make a maximum volume use of your hot plasma. But in this case, the machine was transformed from a normal circular plasma and later on these coils have been added. 
you need more. You need more than only uh, these coils here. You need the transformator. And then you have, this is the primary widening, the plus one, the secondary widening. Then you have in addition this coils here and uh, Pepe is very familiar with them. This is what you need all to shape the plasma, to make it in the right form and to make it stable. So these are the poloidal field coils. And these coils together, there are 24. This together gives you the maximum what you can do in shaping and operation. Now JET is quite old. It's uh, 30 years now old. In 1997, there was this very famous DT campaign, 60 megawatt of fusion power in a deuterium tritium mixture. Something like uh, 200 pulses in total have been done. The machine was operated up to 4.8 megaamp, 3.4 Tesla at this location here. And in the moment it has something like 40 megawatt of input power. It was less at that time. And the record shots were done 20 years, 25 years ago in graphite. Now I will explain why graphite is not so good in a minute, but just that you remind this is the time. And since then the first wall has been exchanged. And you see a picture of the new wall. It's a metallic wall. And uh, the next DT campaign is probably in about two, three months. Now, if you take this cross section here, then you can this typical picture, which you see of the magnetic flux surface. And you have a, a poloidal cross section. Again, this is the confined region inside. It's separated from the open field lines. So this is by the separatrix. And this is the inner diverter lag and the outer diverter lag. Then you have a region here we call the private flux region with no direct contact. And then you have this X point, which is a projection. In reality, the particles are going around and then you have it just as a projection and X. So they are not really crossing in that sense. And then you have here these open magnetic surfaces which hit the target plate. And here's the main exhaust in this configuration. There are also the limiters here. You see them here. They are for startup and also a little bit to protect the uh, wall site inside. If you now look into the plasma conditions here in the center, you have something like 10 kV. So the plasma physicists to speak about EV, 1 EV, 11,600 K. And they have in the diverter something like 1 to 50 EV roughly, depending on the regime, how the diverter is operated. And we speak here about the scrape of layer plasma. This is the diverter plasma. And in the core, it's simply the core plasma. As I said before, everything was out of graphite. Now it has been exchanged. And what you see inside here, this area is made of beryllium. The limiters are made of beryllium and the whole diverter at the bottom is made out of tungsten. It's a slightly different combination. The idea behind is that the beryllium is something like a perfect oxygen getter. I will show how it works in a couple of minutes. And the diverter, and it's low Z, so it's not really harming the plasma, and the diverter should have the best material with low retention and highest capabilities to exhaust heat. So just to show you how dramatic it was, if you worked with graphite, these are pictures from my old machine. It was Textor, it was a graphite machine. And you see here such limiters when it was operated, and you see these dark uh, areas here. This was in carbon co-deposits. So carbon was eroded, transported, and located here. And if you would extrapolate what was found in this machine and also a jet, the erosion and deposition here. So the deposition was about three, four nanometers per second. If you would make this in a machine like a reactor, you would end up with 11 centimeters. And you can calculate how many tons of graphite or carb you would have in the machine. Impossible to operate. So what happens is that you had erosion a lot of chemistry at every energy. And then you had to carbon eroded, transported together with the fuel in the plasma located in other areas. And you build up these layers and here the layers, there can be, you see how they look like after you take them out, they exfoliate, they can be up to millimeter. So this is something like 50 micron, 100 micron, but it's absolutely unstable. And you would have a disaster if you would have this dust in a reactor. And if you would calculate how much retention you would have in this machine, it was 20, 30%. So you would be never able to have a reactor in carbon under such conditions because you would never close the fuel cycle. Now, this is an example from Texto, but we made, when we started with the ether like wall, much more analysis and predicted what would an ether look like, a real ether, if you would have come, and how many discharges you can operate before you would reach some inventory limit given by the authorities. It's about 700 gram of tritium. And you come up with 40 discharges before you would need to clean. 
And then we calculated how would it look like from our best knowledge if you would have this beryllium and tungsten wall. And you would expect that there is a drop in this retention rate. And you would be able to do something like 3,000 or so pulses. These are full power pulses. And this would be something like one year of operation before you have to do some cleaning activity. And so the whole purpose was just for JET to demonstrate this reduction by changing the metallic wall. This is how it looks like before. This is after and everything was done by remote handling. You see it here. So they took this out, replaced it tile per tile. And this took uh, uh, more than a year and one and a half year with conditioning. So it was a very complex uh, uh, work. So what we should demonstrate is this fuel retention that this drop exists. We should see that its uh, erosion is lower if you have not carbon. We should not look for melting, but if it occurs, what happens at the first place? We should see if there's less dust produced because there should be less transport. And of course, if you can exhaust the power and work with a tungsten inverter, which can melt. The graphite cannot melt, it just evaporates, which is very nice. It can shape, but uh, of course, if you have metal, then you melt, you would have issues. And then at the, some point, of course, the performance, but I will not speak about performance. And this is maybe the key result of this experiment. It's a very boring table. In principle, these are different experiments where we measured how much tritium remained in the machine after two hours of plasma operation and divided by the plasma time, which gives you a retention rate. These black points here, these are the points from the carbon time. And you had about 10 to the 22 deuterium per second stored in the machine, which is a very huge number. As I said, if you take this in retention fraction, it's about 20%. And then we have seen this reduction here. So you see more than an order of magnitude. And in this case, we are speaking then about retention fractions of half a percent which is exactly what we expected. This is inside the machine measured. I will explain the technique later. And this is if you take out the tiles, there's always some outgassing later on and you see this drops, but also this one drops. And then you had about a 20 to 40 times reduction. So from that perspective, it's the best choice what you can do. Now I spoke a lot about JET. I show you now one ex example of a discharge which should guide you through the, in principle, Oh, sorry, I have to change probably this one. No, ah, this doesn't work in the moment. Sorry, it's because I'm now I show you it like this. So that's a discharge. You see it first, it's circular. Yeah, this is where the diverter coils are not active. You have interaction with the beryllium wall. See here the time running. Then the diverter coils are switched on. You have this D shape. Here's the X point, the contact point in our outer diverter, very nice. Then it's a little bit power. It's an L mode discharge. And then we have something called H mode and you see some tripling here. These are excursions. These are drops in the pedestal, expelling particles down into the diverter, which we call elms. So that's a typical discharge. Uh, in a, in in jet. Now going back. Uh, now this H mode, as I said, this has been discovered and it's very nice. In principle, you just heat up the plasma, and suddenly there's a change in the stored energy. At the same time, the d alpha, that's a measure for the particle flux which ex escapes, comes into the inverter as recycled. And if this goes down, then there are, of course, less particles reaching the edge, which means the plasma is better confined. And you see how it makes this step by drop. And then you have these excursions. These are these called edge localized modes. This was the flickering, what you have seen. And you see here you have, uh, you have less particles hitting the wall. And there is an increase in energy, which is affected too roughly. I took here the original paper by Fritz Wagner. That's from Astex. So what happened is you have made this barrier. That's the profile, yeah. So this is pressure profile, temperature times density. That's the L mode phase. And when you have the H mode, then you have this profile. And what happens here that it collapses a little bit, particles are escaping before it's rebuilt. And then you get again, this very nice improvement. So that's very nice. It was the best what you can do for probably also ITER. If you have this, you get with a little bit more power, better confinement. The reason is, likely related to shears here, which make an improvement. They're making a, pedal, uh, a barrier uh, inside, 
but uh, all details, I think it's not yet fully understood. Now, if you extrapolate this to larger machine, then this is one of the major headaches which we have in the moment. Um, now, people have just taken these values, made scaling different machines, which have the same regime identified, looked into how big the machine has to be to get these very important confinement time I explained before, five seconds. And if you do so, then you could do this uh, theoretically, yeah? And then you can do this by scaling laws. So you just take safe similar discharges and try to find how these confinement time would rise with the parameters. And this is the parameter for this confinement time. It depends on the uh, plasma current, the negative to the power, uh, radius to almost to the square. These are then uh, uh, quantities related to the shape, magnetic field a little bit, and the density. Most important is again here the major radius and the current, and you see it's almost what people said. So in principle, you can now reverse. You can calculate when do I have five seconds and check where these R should be. And then if you make this, you see, okay, you need something which is twice the size of jet. Then you would have something which is uh, uh, capable. I have to say that uh, when JET was designed, it should have reached Q equals one, the same power in then out, but we were just at 60% or so at the end. Now, if you take the scaling laws and just extrapolate further, then this is JET. You take here the power over the radius, one of the big measures for JET, for ITER, the thermal energy inside per meter, just another quantity, how much plasma seconds you want to operate, what are the heat fluxes? I will explain a little bit more here. And then what should be radiated to sustain? And if you have neutrons, and this is for information at wall temperature. And if you see so, there is a step from here to here. Okay, but it's not drastic. The energy is maybe a factor 20 here. Okay, that's big. But if you go to a reactor, then you see all these quantities in jet and eta are very, 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 very low. So the operation time for a reactor, these are two orders of magnitude, almost more. The heat flux is gigantic and you cannot just simply apply the same solution. The radiation must be much, much higher. And the neutrons, here you have really the neutrons and they can do a lot of damage. And in principle, you should have very high wall temperatures. Now the current demo has not this high temperature, the European one, but in principle, it should be to be more efficient. So you see, it's a very big challenge if you just extrapolate and maybe the scaling laws are not applicable anymore. Now, this is the next step device, ETA. You have all heard about this, I assume. This is the six meter machine. Main goal is to demonstrate that we can do actually fusion and with more power out than in. Should show this with the factor 10 amplification for 400 seconds, thanks to the superconducting coil. And it should show that we have all technology ready. One part which is very critical is the breeding blankets, which are here, which should convert then the nutrients uh, and produce then the tritium, which is needed for the safe sustained operation. Now, <clears throat> the biggest challenge, however, is the plasma wall interaction. Now, this is another picture of ITER. Again, the same cross-section I described before. That's the uh, separatrix, the X point I've showed you, like in jet, the diverter made of tungsten, in this case, actively cooled. The beryllium, which is here, all actively cooled elements, confined plasma, and this is the last close flux surface. Now, what happens is now you have your neutrons. If you have DT, they're providing energy to the wall. You have the helium ash, which comes to the wall, should be transported, then here down into the diverter and here exhausted. And you have also, of course, neutrons, tritons, electrons, everything what is transported. And in principle, that's the scheme. It goes into that area down and it's deposited here or on the other side. If you take the scaling and uh, plasma's done, you have something like 100 megawatt, which you have to exhaust here, which comes at that plate here about 40 megawatt per square meter, which has to be exhausted. However, there is no material and no solution for 40 megawatt per square meter. We can do 20 for a certain time, or we can do steady state 10 megawatt per square meter. So this means, you have to adapt the plasma solution. You have to adapt the solution in the diverter to come to this one. The other point which is important, if you have very energetic particles here, then the tungsten can be sputtered, which means you hit the surface, a tungsten can be released, could be in the core and could cool down your plasma. This is not what you want. The concentration is very low, which is permitted. 
And so you have at the same time to reduce the power load and the impact energy of the particles or the electron temperature, which is related. So this you have to do. You have to do a cold diverter, colder than cold, hotter than hot. So very, very tricky. I spoke now about megawatts, but just to give you an impression. So this is if you go to a beach somewhere, 500 watt per square meter. This was when there was a space shuttle, the silicon carbide, again, very famous material also in fusion. It can do something like half a megawatt per square meter when it enters the atmosphere. That's the ETA first wall blanket. It's five megawatt per square meter. It's made of beryllium. And that's the diverter design. This one can handle 20 megawatt per square meter for 20 seconds or so, and 10 megawatt for steady state. This is a typical solution. It's a monoblock structure. You see it like this one here. There's a cooling pipe, and this one was not very good. You see that the kappa which was used came out, but in principle, it can sustain 20 megawatts or so. Now, that's in reality how in ETA it will look like. It's uh, in this case a very large diverter, if you can imagine. That's a man, man could walk inside. These are cassettes, several tons heavy. And they are like on a carousel and they can be transported inside and rotated and are exchangeable. This one, this part is of stainless steel, the body, and this is then the cooling system. And in front you have the massive monoblocks I showed you before. And here are the active areas. Now I see another picture here in Katya drawing. You see here these types are all these monoblocks. 40, 50,000 monoblocks or so, huge amount, everything cooled. And uh, this is the dome just to increase the neutral pressure here a little bit. And these are some protection targets if there are particles sitting in that area here. Now you have this 500 megawatt fusion power from this factor 10 amplification. This is volumetric, these are the neutrons. And these are the alpha particles which come to the diverter. If you take the diverter area, then you come to this 40 square meter, uh, 40 megawatt per square meter. And then you have to do some magic. And the magic is you have adapt the diverter conditions. And this is done by the detachment, which I will explain in more detail. And then you can come to less than 10 megawatt per square meter. And then you have these transients, which we don't like to have. These are the elms. And at the same time, you have a huge flux of particles, 10 to the 24, 25, ions per square meter per second. And you should be to avoid the sputtering less than 10 EV, or in this case, it's the impact energy. And this is how it looks like. So that's the typical heat flux, which you have as a profile at the mid plane. And this is then what you get here. And when it hits the target, so here would be the target, particles are hitting here, it's the strike line. Then you would have something like this in normal operation, which is attached. And then you have to make some magic, reduce it to come to something like this, very flat. And this you can do by physics, which is related to recycling of fuel, radiation, and you have recombination and charge exchange, which can bring you to this full detachment. Essentially what happens, you are creating a neutral cushion here for the particles impinging. That works perfectly for these particles in steady state, but it is not really working, at least in the moment for the present machines for the AMs, they just burn through. You can optimize a little bit. You can adapt the geometry. You can put some impurities to help. Uh, you can do some dedicated locations for seeding. So these are some tricks. Now I explained to you all these details and about the material, but why on earth do we take tungsten for the diverter? So we are looking for something which has a very high melting point. So because you have these very high heat loads, so it should be a lot of uh, capacity really that you can go to high temperatures. And it should also have a very high thermal conductivity to, uh, to take the heat from the top surface down to your cooling pipes. So the conductivity should be high. And these are the materials which are available if you take in the Mendeleev table. Now, if you look what you can pay, I mean, nobody will do it out of platinum. So then you have only this amount of uh, uh, materials. You have the chromium, the nobium, molybdenum, tungsten, and carbon. Now then you're looking something which is not as critical if it's bombarded by neutrons and should not make something like an uh, isotope which is uh, very long living. So you have something on the request for a reactor low medium activity activation. 
And then actually molybdenum, which is very, very nice, super as a material, easy to handle, it's not really useful. And then you have the chromium, the carbon, the tungsten remaining. And then this is the main change I explained before for the italic wall. You cannot use the carbon because of the dust production by erosion or deposition and then the retention. And you end up with chromium and tungsten. And then the best of these two would be then the tanks because you have a very large window before you do something we call recrystallization where the structure changes. So this is why people are focusing on tanks as a material. Uh, this is the melt temperature, very high. But of course you can then make structures, you can optimize it, but this is why people used uh, tanks as material. Now people are now going back, they're thinking maybe steel could be used with a lot of chromium, Maybe molybdenum may be used in some areas if it's not too large. So there are a lot of discussion. And why? Because this tungsten is very, very complicated to handle. It is brittle and it changes the recrystallization. It can crack. It has a lot of issues in that sense, though it is superb from that point of view I showed you here. And now the beryllium. Why is the beryllium in jet? And why is it in ETA? Well, it is the perfect getter for oxygen. So what you need something to avoid too much tungsten sputtering, you need to get all the impurities out in your vacuum and oxygen is the main contributor. And if oxygen hits your tungsten, then a lot of tungsten will be released. So you have to get out the oxygen and you can do this by applying beryllium or you can take bore in principle. The beryllium in this sense is a self refreshing in situ conditioning technique in jet and eater. So what you do, you cover a little bit your surfaces, like at the wall, like the recessed area, and you get the oxygen, it's just buried inside. And so it's out of the cycle and cannot sputter. Now, if you take a boronization, then you have to replenish this every time. Or if you have like a jet or eater, you will have always beryllium erosion in the first wall and you have in situ the conditioning, which is perfect. Super solution for jet, super solution for eater, but it is not applicable for a reactor. Because if you would take a reactor in beryllium, then you would have again a lot of erosion, a lot of dust, and it's not compatible. So you need to do something different for a reactor. Now coming to the diverter physics in more detail. Um, here the typical picture, what happens now again, the X point, you see it here. Then you have the particles escaping around the X point. You have a 30 EV or so. You can put impurities which radiate here to reduce the temperature. Then you can do some, uh, there's some plasma physics behind, ionization which you have, charge exchange. And at the end, if you're very cold, you can go to volume recombination and then you have your neutral particle cloud which you need. <clears throat> now, a typical picture is if you take the standard book of Stengelby, that's a cross section. Here's the confined region I showed you before, strike line X point. And here are the pumps at the bottom. This is how it looks like. If you take the conditions, electron temperature, maybe 50 V in normal operation, detached, you want to go to one EV. Electron density here is maybe 10 to the 17, 18. Normal operation here, it's 10 to the 19. If you go to detachment, very large machine, 10 to the 21. So the density here, is larger than here. And in this case, the plasma is then still ionizing if it's hot, but if you're below one EV, then it's a recombining high density cold plasma. This is when you can do the, your detachment. Now I had here also the picture of a limiter machine. Just imagine you would cut this limiter and unfold this side and this side, then you get to this picture here, left-hand side of the limiter, right-hand side of the limiter. That's the center of the plasma. Here's the confined plasma. Particles are coming out of the plasma by a perpendicular transport here, cross field transport coming into that area, which is this last loss flux surface, have a certain penetration depth, if you like. It's the decay length for density, temperature, and power. And then the particles are converted and have parallel flows into these target plates where they usually hit them with iron sound speed. And this is where the damage can then later on happen. You could also imagine here, not the limiter, but the target plates. It's actually the same. So if the ions are hitting the surface, then if they are not energetic enough, they will just hit the surface. And at some point the deuterium will be then released. Then you speak about recycling. If they're very energetic, they can harm, and then you create impurities. And this is then of course not so nice. 
At that point, there is actually no velocity, and then it decides to go here and there. This is what we call the stagnation plane or point. Just to show you the picture, how it looks like a circular plasma, such a limiter. It's the limiter here. You see a confined region. And what you see, this red, is in principle the hydrogen, which is coming in. And the hydrogen in this case is deuterium molecules and atoms. They're coming here inside, neutralized, coming as neutrals. Then you can see them coming into the plasma, ionized, transported, cross field transport in another place into this region and come back. This is what we call recycling. What you see is the Balma emission. I will not speak about here uh, much detail, but you can actually distinguish which spa, uh, species is coming to this location. Now you can learn a little bit what are the temperatures by spectroscopy. You can take also uh, Langmuir probes, but if it's very, very cold, it's more challenging. So you can take this Balma line profile, you see it here. It's the same wall temperature. It's just a different density and temperature. And you see that the shape changes and it's changing in the wrong direction, if you like. It's a cold uh, uh, plasma, it's a hotter plasma and the cold plasma uh, has a broader line. And the reason for this is you are changing the destruction process. So you start with the molecule from the surface. And if it's very hot, then you produce a hydrogen atom and an ion. This one has a certain energy, very low, this one. And if it's a, this temperature range, you go directly here and produce two typical hydrogen atoms from common energies of a couple of EV, which you have here. So you can look on the line and you can say which of the paths you have. I so told you there are molecules. They are little, you can see, because most of the molecules, when they appear, they are already ionized. And the little bit, if you sum up, you have to multiply with very large numbers to convert into the particles. If you have graphite, 90% come as a molecule. If you have tungsten, it's maybe 50%, and the rest is atom because most is uh, reflected. Now coming to the detachment, so you have to have these cold cushion here. This is what you want to do. And then you have to have all these processes switched on. So how, how you can do this, you just put in gas into the machine, into the diverter and rise actually uh, the density, you see here flow of deuterium particles in, into the machine, it's going up. That's the pressure in the subdiverter of jet. You see here two curves, black is calm, red is uh, eta like wall. You see it goes up, 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 up. And if you measure then the flux of particles, so if I go back, how many particles are coming here to that location, then you see first with increase of gas, it goes up more ions, 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 and then it drops. This is what we call the rollover. And in this case, you start to prepare your cold cushion. This is the ions, and you see the cushion actually on the Balma radiation, because the radiation goes up, 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 up. You have more and more neutrals there. You can do this for the inner and outer diverter. It's the same. And you can also look what radiates. And in this case, it's an Elmut plasma. Actually, the deuterium is sufficient to radiate. If you have much more power, then this is not sufficient anymore as a mechanism and you need to add something in addition, which are impurities. Now, if you go into that region here, this is what I explained. If you go to even colder temperatures to make this running, you need other reactions. This is done all by electron impact. You need to have proto collisions and you go that path. And then you are about one to three V. That's the magic region, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> That's the magic region you have to go. <clears throat> the physics is very, very complex because all these molecules which are present <clears throat> are doing a lot of uh, vibrational excitation. <clears throat> and then you have different paths and different mechanisms. So that's one of the hot topics to, in the present device because it's only for hydrogen, but you can imagine deuterium, tritium, and that's very, very complex. If you have a machine where you have a very large uh, distance between the X point and the target plate, then you can even see the different zones appearing. This is uh, from TCV, where they could really show this different ranges, ionization, charge exchange, recombination, and then finally the density drop. This is what you can do. Um, how you can diagnose, you look on radiation, but you can also look on the Balma lines. You see recombination lines. You can take these and calculate backwards what conditions. This is an example from, from Aztex I have once measured. It's a 1.2 EV cold plasma. This is really what, what you get here. But what you need to do is uh, you need to have a very complex model. 
complex model to describe all these collision radiation processes stolen here from a paper by Ono. And this is actually what you can see if you have here the target plate in India plasmas, but it's equivalent to the picture I showed you here. Now, if you have more and more power, you have first to come to this regime that you can use this radiation. So you have to have some impurity radiation before you can really come to this very cold recombination range. In jet, this is done typically by seeding species like nitrogen and neon. And this is the peak heat flux versus the radiated power in total for the different species. You put more of the species in, you radiate more, the power goes down and you have created, you can see it here in experiment, you have created actually your cushion and you see how the profile, this is again the strike line, how the profile of the power load goes down and it, in the end it is really flat as expected. Now the species behave a little bit different depending on the plasma and the regime. The nitrogen typically radiates mainly directly in the diverter. It has an optimum range from the temperature, something like 30, 40 EV if you like. Whereas the neon is a little bit different. It also radiates at higher temperature. And so it also, there is some radiation in the, in the, in the mantle outside. So for the size of a jet machine, nitrogen may be the best. If you go to larger machine, neon might be a better case. Just to show you now an example of such a discharge, this is one of the record shots we have done in nitrogen. And now again, I have to go out, unfortunately. Ah, no, I can do it. Discharge starts, limiter, so you're somewhere here, then nitrogen is applied. When the nitrogen is applied, it's a very stable, long discharge. Nitrogen is switched off and you get again this very big air excursions, plasma stops. You turn down the magnetic field and the current and you see how nicely will it land. Sorry, that was with sound. So that's a typical super discharge with impurity seeding. This is what ETA has to do in principle. Um, unfortunately, uh, we were not able to continue with such discharges in the recent years because a jet nitrogen is not allowed as a material for seeding because of some pollution of the uranium beds. In ETA it is. Just to show you this plasma it has a very good confinement, high density, low Z effective, and we have done similar now at a higher beta n, really very important discharges. The temperature is very low, so you don't have tungsten sputtering, steady state only by some uh, elms inside. These are typical pictures for the seeding. Inside you see neon, argon, nitrogen seeding. Here's the location. This one should be actually mostly here and here you see some kind of mantle around. And so there are some differences. Unfortunately, we were not able to get more than 65 to 70% radiation in the diverter. Then these uh, discharges are unstable. And I think that I can now make a break, uh, Giuseppe, and then we can continue maybe in five minutes or so. Okay. Thank if you. you have questions, I can also answer already questions. Question from outside. No questions inside. No so we can have the breath. Just five minutes that I can drink some water and then we can continue. Okay. And tanks diverter, it's more like a, a Swiss cheese here in the main chamber with a lot of steel, but the main interaction zones are really brilliant. <laughs> So what are then plasma surface interaction processes? Let me guide to this very complex uh, slide. So what you have is your fuel, which can be deuterium, later on tritium. And some of this can come into the surface, which are these green dots, can be implanted. If this uh, very heavy material lot can be reflected, as I said, reflection in tanks is very high. It can also recombine at the surface, released in de de deuterium. And it can also by itself, depending on the temperature, dissolve deuterium. So if the top surface is saturated, then for each particles which comes in at some other place, a deuterium molecule can come up or a reflected particles. So that's what is 
relate in these particles as deuterium can come back or the tritium. Fill the plasma can be ionized, transported, come back. So that's the fuel cycle picture. Inside the material, you can have diffusion, so it's transported down. It can even go through it in its permeation, or if the material is not perfect, it can be trapped. And then it would be a storage inside. Now, if you have neutrons, they can do some damage and you can store here more, and that's not really what you would like to have. Best is nothing should stay inside, or at least not deep inside. Now, if you have a certain energy, what can happen, of course, is that you start to damage your surface material. And so if this would be calm, you would have chemistry, you would have chemical erosion or chemical sputtering. If it would be methane or something like this, you can heat up and also methane can directly be released, but you start to damage your surface. But the most common is this one, it's a physical sputtering. You just hit it, you have some cascades inside, and at some place, uh, material from the surface, an atom is released. Inside the material can you have, depending how it's prepared, voids, vacancies, loops, and so on. They all can have issues and uh, can hamper actually the, the material. Now, when this material comes again in, then you have inside the plasma started to pollute it. You have impurities. And of course, they can also come back in another place. If they come back, they can come together with the fuel, and then you create these layers. These layers can again re erode, and then the cycle is continuum. Then you have some transport. There can be also other materials embedded, and then you start to make mixed layers. And of course, you can also have the impurities themselves sputter uh, the basic material. If they have the same mass, then this is a very, very effective process. So if tungsten hits tungsten, that's something which has a very, very high efficiency for this release. Now, if you have, in that case, tungsten, there is no chemistry, there are no layers, and so you're just dealing with physical sputtering, maybe, and impurity sputtering. If you have carbon, you have all this, what you have seen here. So then tungsten, as I said, is very good, but why is it uh, so dangerous? So that's the profile of the plasma radius. It's the edge, here's the tungsten source, here's the diverter. If tungsten is released from that area, comes in and you have not much what you can do. And in the center, it tends to accumulate. So if you have something in, it sucks inside and goes up and then you can have even negative profiles. That's not what you would like. Why is it? It's a transport question and it's also the cooling capability which is enormous for these very heavy material. Before it is fully ionized, you go through all these ionization stages and you have a lot of possibilities to radiate. And you see here, this is carbon and this is beryllium, quite drastically different. So what you have to do is you have to omit that a lot comes in and this you can try to reduce the source. Still you have the transport. And then if, it have, if you have no other means, then you have to heat up the core and try to release it out of that region by transport. These are the, the tools what you have. Now you see carbon here is this blue one, it has something I explained before. It has this very nice peak about 80, 100 EV. And that's actually at the end of the diverter. So that's why it is so good for radiating. It helps you for free. And then it helps you with the radiation at the, at the target. On the other hand, the hydrogen is not doing much here. And only that small part is really helping at the, at the end. Beryllium is not very effective here. So what happens now with the tungsten, if it is sputtered, I described this before, then it can be transported. And this is, can be very short because it's so heavy. And remember, I showed you the, uh, the llama radius. It's uh, so heavy that it can come within one duration back to the surface. That's very short. It can go a couple of steps or it can go into the core and then transport it to other locations. If it is in this short range, yeah, within one llama radius or a couple of micrometers, millimeters, then we speak about local deposition. If it goes through the plasma, then it's going to remote areas. Then it's deposited. Now, either you have then you have then this situation here again, you have enough energy to sputter again, and then you have this cycle, and then we speak about migration. Or you have the reach the region where it at the end you don't have enough energy for this species to sputter then this tungsten will stay there. I speak about a graveyard, if you like. It's not the end point. 
So that's what you have as a cycle. And uh, that's very much depend on the impact energy of the particles. In the case of carbon, it's much different because chemistry has no really a, a threshold, but tungsten has a very energetic defined threshold. And you see here the threshold. That's the sputtering yield versus energy. These are calculations, binary collision. This is if you would have tungsten and deuterium impact, you would need a lot of impact energy to sputter. If you have hydrogen plasma, it's almost impossible to sputter. It's so light that there will be no effect. Tritium is a little bit increased. If you have an impurity like beryllium, carbon, nitrogen inside, then these curves you show you, this is sputtering of tungsten by these species, it's possible. So what you have to do is you have to have your plasma colder than that point here, that it will not sputter. This is what is the threshold in energy. I have for reference also beryllium. You see it here, it's very light. And the physical sputtering of carbon. You see that more beryllium can be sputtered at low energies if it just take the physical sputtering. But it has also the chemical branch here. And this one is continuously high. And this was the reason why you had all these layers, dust, and co-deposition. So we are speaking about tungsten, deuterium, tritium, and some speed, seeding species. And so you are somewhere here. If you go on the left-hand side, no tungsten should be released. And so everything should be safe. So if you have the right diverter regime. Now you can also look how much can the plasma accept. This is the tungsten in the core, and it accepts only 10 to the minus 4 or 5 before you start to radiate too much. Um, these are other species, and if you have carbon and beryllium, radiation is not really the dominant one for a reactor. It would be just the dilution. You don't have enough partners of deuterium tritium anymore to collide and make fusion, but you would have a lot of beryllium which would com compete. <clears throat> Now, in, in the case of jet, beryllium is the main impurities because you have a lot of beryllium from the wall. It's sputtered according to this curve. And then the beryllium comes into the diverter and can interact with the tungsten. And if you see this, this is again a, a yield versus temperature. This is an Elmwood plasma going high in density, low in temperature. Then you see if you go down that curve here, there's almost no sputtering. You have reached the threshold. And these are measurements in hydrogen. This is in deuterium. And you see there's the energy, something like 40 EV or so of, of impact energy or something like uh, 8 EV or so of uh, temperature. And if you're here, practically no tungsten would be released. Now, <clears throat> there is something in addition. That's gross. Gross erosion means you start with the tungsten. It comes inside. But as I said, it is so heavy that you would have the chance if you have the iron and within a lama radio, it can go back. So effectively, not every tungsten which is released actually enters the plasma, but stays in the diverter. It's uh, screened and it's locally redeposited. So you can measure this if you look on tungsten one and tungsten two, these are um, spectroscopic lines which you can observe and take the ratio, you can see how much goes out and how much really escapes. But what is more important is you would need to measure this difference between gross, everything is sputtered, goes in, to really what is net, what really comes back, because everything radiates as neutral. This you can see. But how much really escapes and doesn't come back, you can only see if you would have an experiment where you erode and measure before and after the experiment how much really escaped. And we had a one-time chance in JET to do this, compare the spectroscopy and this post-mortem. But it's a very costly experiment because you need to do a lot of discharges to have significant sputtering that you can measure this. This was done with such type of interlayer, that's the bulk tungsten, molybdenum, and on top some tungsten. And we had this before and after and measured how much was eaten up. What we have done were 150 discharges, two weeks, and maybe Giuseppe remembers, at the end of the first year, 900 seconds of plasma, all very similar. You see here the fluxes, the fluence, and we had about 30,000 amps. So in principle, very good statistics, very constant. And then you can take for that uh, tiles, uh, the, uh, for that conditions, the tiles out and compare spectroscopy with post-mortem. We have used it on a dedicated location, not used before. 
This sounds a lot, two weeks of jet, but this is an eta baseline plasma. You see it's uh, not as long if you take this all up, but more power, more energy, more flux, maybe similar fluid, uh, similar ion flux, uh, larger fluids. <clears throat> the uh, abetted area is maybe similar, similar amps, similar number of amps, but you're not nearby. Yeah, So these two weeks is not really representative even for one eta plasma in DT. But it is something more like a pre-fusion plasma operation plasma. This is the startup of ETA, the first couple of years. So there we have similar times, similar power, similar energy. Of course, we have 150 parts, there's only one, but such two weeks are representative for such a period. We took these tiles out and you see how the tungsten was eaten up. This was before, this was after. The molybdenum was the interlayer, it was not touched. We looked how much deuterium was inside, and you see there's no deuterium inside at that location. It's below what is can you can you measure? Because this was very hot, above 1300 degrees C, and there's no retention anymore measurable. There was some beryllium co-deposited here. And once you have some beryllium, also some deuterium is again visible. But inside that location, it was very clean, almost no impurities, only it's sputtering. So you get from this one a number of particles eroded. This was the thickness. Then we looked on spectroscopy, take the light, convert it, and got these numbers for the net erosion, for the gross erosion. And if you compare the 95% of the tungsten, which started from the surface, didn't come into the plasma, but just was coming back to the surface. This is what the redeposition is so high. That's very important. Otherwise, our plasmas would even, at these conditions, uh, be killed. I have to say these plasmas are attached, ionizing. Not what I said before for the uh, uh, for the studies uh, in, in 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 ETA where you need semi detachment. This is an attached one just to validate our codes, at least on the outer part. Now, why we have this still this sputtering because the temperature was low, it should not be so high. That's actually this is the cause. This is again the pedestal I showed you before. Density, temperature. These are I think something like ten thousand amps averaged. And you see here this crash. This is an elm excursion, so the pedestal drops, recovers. And during this time, these particles, which are, let's say, covered here, go out of the confined region, go into the scrape of layer and reach the target plate. And they are consisting out of deuterium and a little bit beryllium, and they are doing sputtering. They're doing so much sputtering that you can see it in the target plates with spectroscopy. And it's even so high on the inboard side that you can have some recombination inside, so high density. On the other side, it was still ionizing. But if you now look in details into a time trace, yeah, then you can see in some conditions, this is a different plasma just to visualize it, that you can switch off between these um, excursions, the tungsten sputtering, there's nothing, you're cold enough, but every and each of these amps is hot enough that you can never burst inside because you're above the threshold. And so you have switched on everything between amps, but the amps survive. And then you get this signal here of tungsten, the influx, and that's a 2D picture over the target plate. You see at this tricline between amps, everything switched off. Before and after you had some sputtering and only the amps survived. So it's what remains if you have an LMEH mode, every amp will produce some tungsten. But overall, again, as I said before, 95% of the tungsten remained in the surface. So even if it's an amp sputtered, majority will come back to the surface. We also looked on how this ratio is between intra amp to elm typically, and you get something like 70, 80% by elms under these conditions. Uh, it depends a little bit on the total electron temperature, but this is for typical jet conditions. So that's again the mechanism I described, which is so important. So if you have a tungsten ion, you ionize it, you have the Lama radius, and within this Lama radius, you come to the surface, it sticks, and it's not escaping. In carbon beryllium, it comes out. The Lama radius is so small that it's directly bound to the magnetic field line and transported away. Now, in reality, it's not as simple as like this because there could be already here collisions. It could be transported further. So what you can take as a measure is the time of one uh, gyration, and this is typically what we call then uh, it's locally redeposited with one gyration time. And this is this number you have seen before, 95%. We have modeled this. We have a code called ERO to model such things. 
And what you see here is the picture that's the target plate, the outer diverter. That's the gross erosion in blue. And that's the local deposition in red. And you see they're almost perfectly matched. And that's really what is sputtered away. And this is something what can come into the plasma and pollute the plasma. You see, it's a very small amount, which is really the good thing for, uh, you know, for the case of, of tungsten. This is for the inner diverter. It's slightly different. It has some different geometry. And we have done this for the AM phase and the inter AM phase. And of course, during AMs, it's not as perfect as between AMs. And on the inner diverter between the AMs, the inner diverter of jet was detached already. Nothing happens, and you had only the source during the AM. Now, there's something else which I should say um, if you have the tungsten in. And I go back to this graph here. Now, if you have tungsten in the confined region, there is also some tungsten in the pedestal region. And if the pedestal breaks, drops, then also the tungsten can escape. But if it escapes, then of course you have no more pollution inside, which is a good thing, because it tells you the tungsten is expelled from the confined region. And what you see here is actually such an effect. This is increase of AM frequency and increase of source, as I explained before. Every amps is counting uh, some tanks. You see it goes linearly up to a certain frequency. Then this drops because these amps are different in impact energy. These are something like type 3 amps. This is type 1. But you see between 40 and 60 hertz, it still goes up. But if you look how much tungsten is in the plasma as a content, then you see it rises only up to 40 hertz. And then it is something like constant, and then it drops. And the constant is that you have expel of tungsten from the confined region. We are speaking here about flushing. This is what you get in, in jet. For ETA, it may be different. So that's the holy question. What happens in ETA? Some models predict that instead of going out, more tungsten would go in. That's a very critical question we are trying to address. We looked here into the concentration in the core, and you see it was fine. These plasmas had very low concentration. They survived. Now, I also said something about these. Uh, impurity radiation inside, if you have this cold blob, that's an example. You have here very large uh, radiation in the core, 60 megawatt with 60 megawatt input power 20, um, and you cannot survive. But if you have core heating, in this case is ion cyclotron resonance heating, you see here the drop, the plasma survives. Otherwise, you have a collapse and it drops. So you can apply core heating. This can also be done in ETA. I spoke all about tungsten now, which is the most critical. The beryllium is not doing so much to the plasma itself, apart from doing the sputtering, but it is not really harming. The only thing where the beryllium plays a role is in the retention. And so what we have to know is how much beryllium is produced because there can be co-deposition. And so we modeled this. This is again aero code, you see it. It's a Monte Carlo code describing with the plasma background, this is an um, H2D irene plasma background, the interaction with the wall. This is then the erosion and the local deposition. You see it's eroded in the main chamber and deposition in the diverter, as you can expect it. You may compare this with carbon, and if you do the comparison, then you have less eroded, less transported, and less deposited because there is no chemistry simply. The same code has been applied for JET, as I said here, in all molds, different uh, conditions. We have looked where it's deposited, in gaps, in diverter, in the chamber. And the same code has been used for prediction to ETA. And unfortunately, what we didn't expect is that the shape would change inside of the deposition. In JET, everything goes back into that location here where the deposition plays, takes place. Unfortunately, in ETA with the same code, just different plasma conditions, a lot of the beryllium stays in the main chamber, which is good for the beryllium, of course. You will not have so much net erosion but you can have co-deposition in the main chamber, which is very difficult to get rid. So that's some of the critical questions for ETA now, after we have done the experiments. In JET, all the deposition was almost here in that place of the inner diverter. This is how it looks like, that's the tungsten layer. And this is the co-deposit on top. And there was the fuel, you see here, that area here, zero one, beryllium, a lot of deuterium, and the rest, there's nothing. So there's only in that location really, significant. It was more than two-thirds of all the retention was on that place. We have also modeled this. This is another code we used. It's Waldine. 
They could describe the global transport, erosion, beryllium deposition at the same place. And this code can also tell you how much fuel you have inside, so it can measure the retention. And then when you do this, then you get these curves here. These are the measurements I showed you before. And these are the predictions for jet from this code. And these are the predictions for ETA. That's for beryllium tungsten. And that's for the carb machine. And you see from here to here, that's again the retention rate, this famous drop you see here. You can see it also in the code prediction, which is very nice. So instead of these 40 discharges, you can do 3,000 to 20,000 discharges, which is, I think, very, very important. Okay, so why we have this deposition, or why we have this retention, the mechanism of this co-deposition with beryllium. Implantation plays no role, it's not really relevant, that one is dominating. But if you would have a full tungsten machine, this one would be the dominant one. And this is actually what you see, it's the retention per incident fluence, so how many particles are hitting. These are different materials, red is uh, the tungsten. At the right temperature, you see it's a very small amount, and this is also why in the bulk tanks nothing has been found. It's high temperature, and it was below a tenth of a promil, which is really very low. In carbon, it's a little bit more. But the dominant one, as I said, if you have beryllium, then this is the dominant one. You can have about 10% uh, deuterium in the beryllium co-deposit, depending on the temperature. It's less than in carbon, where it can be one to one. It's maybe 10% but it should not be anything in tanks, and this is where the reactor will be. Okay, <clears throat> but what? how do we measure this in a machine? Then you can do this during the pulse, looking how much gas in, how much gas out, calculate the difference, and then you get something like how much is retained. It's so intra-shot. This will be a very huge number because usually it's just a transient. It doesn't stick to the wall. If you wait, it gas out with the time. So what we have done is these gas balances, and this was the picture of these bars you have seen before. So we have closed all valves, cryo pump was fresh, inject particles, do the plasmas, everything is pumped on the cryo, regenerate the cryo, know how much is pumped, compare these two, and what is missing is what is in the machine, stored. And these are the pictures with the bars. This has something like two hours of outgassing, and we call this as long-term retention. But really most critical later on for a reactor is what remains forever inside or deeper inside. And this you can only extract, unfortunately, by post-mortem where you have to do destructive. And this is somewhere here in between is your 700 gram limit for, for ETA. Uh, as I said, this is a scheme. These are the measurements. Okay, coming now to the last point, which is the outlook to ETA and demo. Now, again, this is the shape of ETA and ETA is built. There is a plan. So that's the normal plan, the research plan. They will start 2025 with the limiter plasma. There are no plasma facing components inside apart from some very strange limiter plasmas just to see that the magnetic field coils are okay, no issues. Then they stop and then they will install the diverter. And then when the diverter will be installed, it's here, you will have operation which is called pre-fusion power operation. This is similar to, as I said, these 150 discharges uh, of jet is one of these pulses roughly. And then they will start to do this in hydrogen and in helium, start to learn a different current. They will try to operate, learn how to deal with disruptions, learn, let's say, algorithm programming, look a little bit in the retention also, and start to measure and test all the diagnostics. And there's not enough power at that stage to come to an H mode, all is omic or L mode. Then at this point, they will do then a power upgrade. More uh, uh, diagnostics will be installed. And in this phase, there should be enough power to come into H mode. If you would have helium or helium hydrogen, there's not allowed in any up to that point, any deuterium in the machine because the deuterium would directly create so much activation and tritium that you cannot enter anymore and do anything. So that's something very critical. Even the hydrogen has very high purity because the deuterium inside in normal bottles would also be already sufficient to get to uh, tritium and DT, um, reactions and neutron activation. 
So then here they hope to have H mode. And when they have H mode, the first thing is what they will try is to get rid of the AMPs. And they are doing this by so-called RMP coils. These are magnetic perturbation coils, which change the magnetic structure at the edge and should mitigate uh, these AM excursions with the same type of conditions in the core. So that's very risky. Nobody knows if it will work properly. It works in D3D. It doesn't work in Aztecs in that way. In Aztecs, it uh, mitigates, but the AMPs are simply smaller. So that's a very critical question. And then they will start to use uh, deuterium, and as soon as a little bit deuterium inside, you are in a deuterium tritium phase. Now the diverter is manufactured here. It will be installed very late, so you cannot really have any impact on the design anymore. The machine, the complex is built up. That's a picture from last year, I think. You see it here now. If you look, everything is inside. Even this is a closed building now. And if you look on the ETA page, you will see how they started to put in the cryostat. This is how it will look like at the end. So in principle, the machine is under manufacturing. And there are not many questions you can really do in point of design of components, at least for the first phase. Um, what you can do is a lot of modeling. So you can help them to see if all these nice fancy plasma solutions are really working. So you can take Sopias Arena, you can apply it for neon and nitrogen, which you need in deuterium and tritium, try to model and see if you can create this detachment in the geometry, if you have enough power to do this, if you have the enough pressure. So you can guide them by modeling where is the operational window they have to do. This is a picture of the plasma density, the electron temperature, and you see here the pressure and you see how the pressure drop. So they found here a solution really with detachment and they can guide you where it is. And they can do it at very high density because they have to get rid of a lot of these uh, power load. So they really have to demonstrate. This is where the modeling can help. And this is what we are doing. We are modeling these neon nitrogen plasmas or jet to see if it can model this one. And then of course you can look in all details I described about the plasma, about the cushion. Now there are other questions and now I'm coming to the side of, of my work package more. What we can still do though, everything is ready in the principle, the research plan is ready. There are still critical question. Um, there was something coming up all the time. For example, what will come is at some point they will ask what happened in the limiter phase with the limiter is made of nickel or whatever. Uh, what is going on? And so they will ask. But really what will be done is, what we can help ITER is to learn how to operate the tungsten inverter and the beryllium first wall. And we are doing this at very high heat flux exposures, for example, in Magnum, it's a linear device. So here you can do in one day, one year of ITER operation of fluents. You can do this in tokamaks like West, if you have access. You can do this even for high repetitive loads. You can go over the limits and see how these uh, tools or these uh, components which ETA has, uh, how they will develop with fatigue if you have multiple cycles, and what happens if you go beyond the normal time. So what happens if you have damage or recrystallization? So what we can do is we can simulate ETA lifetime. We can go beyond the limits and see what will happen if you damage it. So this is all with the so-called budget approach for the lifetime of the tungsten inverter. The other thing what we can do is this beryllium in the main chamber is very critical now, uh, this redeposition, because the tritium is inside and you cannot go very high in temperature to bake it. So you will need to look for fuel recovery schemes. So you need to know how long I have to bake to go out, do I need to do something else? And so what we are doing in the moment is we are developing diagnostics. And I've seen that our colleagues from LIPS are here. So LIPS is also used here to identify where these deposition is and apply a technique inside of ETA to measure how the deposition takes place and which place is location, what is the composition and one, how much tritium is inside. So that's something we are trying to help. We are doing it a little bit in the lab because essentially what ETA did for the lips is a remote handling arm and that's very difficult to build in the machine. Maybe JET will do this. It was done in uh, FTU, but it is something we are looking. The other thing is there's lit QMS. So it's laser induced desorption. You heat up only the surface and measure the gas. This is the standard routine tritium monitor diagnostic ETA will use at one location. 
And this we are trying to qualify and also test a jet and in the laboratory. And then in addition, we are trying to help how you can on earth bake or use some plasmas to get the tritium out. And there are some dedicated experiments. So this is all related to the fuel retention question and fuel recovery. It's in the housekeeping approach. It is not relevant for hydrogen. It's not relevant for helium. But once they will start deuterium and tritium, this will be very critical because it will determine the, uh, let's say, the cycle, how you can use the machine. And the last one which we are looking is related to the beryllium. Um, because of the shape of the plasma, so if you take an eta plasma, uh, there are some locations which have very narrow distance to the wall. And there are these, uh, let's say, fluctuations and you have turbulent transport, very long, uh, flat profiles which can hit the surface. So there can be a lot of beryllium erosion. And I showed you some runs from Aero. And we have seen this is a critical issue. It could create so much beryllium that you would have at some point an issue with the lifetime of the components. And it can also be an issue related to the dust production. And so we are trying to do some experiments, see how this develop. One is by normal erosion. And I didn't spoke about it, but you could have a lot of disruptions which can do uh, conditions and so these two questions are addressed and we try to model them and then look what happened if you have beryllium deposited is it stable or is it really critical as operation so these are really a couple of the key few questions where you can still have an impact on ETA otherwise you have to wait until the machine will operate we know there are a lot of issues we know melting I didn't have time to speak about this we know that there are these issues with the power decay length all this is known but you cannot do anything but these three are some regions where you can do something. And then on the other side, which is more critical is Gebo, which is on the long-term perspective. And in our work package, we are trying to address these questions. Now I showed you at the beginning how big the scaling is. And the machine we are speaking is not 500 megawatt ETA, but two gigawatt demo. But still you have the limit of 10 megawatt per square meter. And if you do so, then you will see you cannot tolerate any, any real uh, transients. So in principle, you should have an ELMI H mode without ELMS. So it means the same confinement, but no excursions. That's something which is a very big question how to achieve. It's done in the Tokamak uh, community. And uh, we are just trying to see how we can cope with the materials which we have. And how can we sustain for the stationary solution, the diverter? We don't really count on the amps. They have to be mitigated by either plasma or by very dedicated control schemes. The other thing we are very worried is about the tungsten because as I said, demo will not be uh, beryllium in the main chamber, but it will be everywhere tungsten or tungsten and steel maybe, but mainly with some tungsten surface. And then you don't have only tungsten coming from here and here which can be screened, but it can also come from the sides here by charge exchange neutrals interaction. And this is poorly screened and can soak into the core. And then you have to uh, be careful that you are not reading, uh, reaching the uh, high concentration. So that's very, very critical. At the same time, you have to apply seeding impurities. You have to have pumping available that the machine can survive. You have to breed tritium and you have to get the helium out. And all these is big questions, very big questions which have to be answered. So we have started to simulate machines in full tungsten with this aero code. We are looking and on sputtering, how is it transported? How much is from the main chamber coming out with neon or nitrogen or argon or other species? So we try to simulate how it will look like. We are doing at the same time tests, and this is in a linear plasma device. This says plasma conditions at that place, like in the diverter of demo. And these are monoblocks, potential solutions. So we are trying to see how these components work if you have a year or so of operation. We are looking then also on something in addition because this is without any neutron damage. But what happens if you have neutron damage? Is there any retention inside? How critical it is? Is it accumulated? Is there a combination of helium damage, neutron damage increasing, and out of your less than a promille of retention, you can easily get to 1%, which is then critical. Does it stay? God, can you get it out? 
these are questions which are looking, and that's only relevant for demo, because these damage you can only produce if you have the very high fl uh, flux or neutral fluence. Then we are looking into the retention uh, in the in the radiation in the diverter, as I showed before. I showed you a discharge from jet uh, with nitrogen. This is a discharge from Astex with krypton and nitrogen. Again, the diverter radiator, and you see some core radiation. These discharges reach more than 90%, which are very good. And of course, we are looking also to other diverter solutions because the diverter in the signal now, like here, might not be enough to get rid this 20 megawatt or 10 megawatt. And then you have to look what are different possibilities. And not that this is enough of a challenge. You have to look also how these can be pumped away, that it's sustained, and you have to do this for steady state conditions. This one I explained already. It's so very critical for ETA as again, uh, this gross and net erosion and how much really is there. There's one challenge. Nobody yet has really exactly the conditions of a demo uh, diverter. The density is so high that you could have more collisions. And if you have more collisions, then this promptly deposition is not really working anymore. And also if the temperature is so low, it's also not working because you're not ionizing. So you have to see where exactly you are because you are so cold that you're not sputter enough. But if you sputter, it can escape. So it will be a very complex description on the target plate where you are. And we are trying to simulate this. We are also trying to look if this radially deposited tungsten has the same conditions like the eroded, uh, the normal tungsten which you built in, or if there's different properties. So this is something we address. And then there's this very big question about all the retention if you have trapping defects, neutrons, and how much, what happens actually if you have nutrient damage and you have permeation through. That's a very critical question related to the uh, uh, licensing also for demo. A demo will also have a licensing, maybe not 700 gram, maybe two kilogram of tritium. But if there is too much in the wall or the diverter stored, then you have also an issue. Plus this tritium, which is stored inside, is not any more available for the fuel cycle. That's really critical. Um, fuel cycle is this one here. You see how the pumping is done. So we have here dedicated studies with the fuel cycle in the different geometries. And we try to find out if you can really extract and operate the diverter in the right regime, because it's always related to injection of particles and pumping of particles. And we have in some regions probably reached the limit. And what remains is then, which might be the alternative diverter configuration, which is capable to exhaust more than where we are now, because we might be at the limit with our single diverter and one radiator. We may need to do a long leg. We may need to do double null or very complex one. Whereas this complex one might not be capable or not but be possible in environment of a reactor. So we have to see which is the best one. And with this, I think I'm at the end, just at the end. <clears throat> we have developed, or this has been developed in Eurofusion, components for the diverter. This is how they look like. Again, this monoblock, they are tested. You see they can survive more than 20 megawatt for a very short time, which gives you some freedom. But of course, these are five cycles. And a reactor diverter should sustain two and a half years or so before the neutron damage is so high that you would lose performance. And so what we want to do is test these samples under cycling, very high fluence and with transients. And with this, I am finished. If you have questions or if you have later questions, you can send me questions. But this was something like an overview of what we are doing, the understanding of PWI and what is uh, the remaining activity probably in the moment. Thank you. Uh, yes. Many thanks. There are uh, a question from inside. They come here. Yes. Welcome. Uh, oui. um, I saw that one of the materials used for the plasma phasing components is uh, beryllium, and um, I saw also that uh, boron is um, taught. And uh, no, no, it's thought um, has shown so, some properties for uh, plasma regulation 
and uh, moderation inside fusion. Why those two materials uh, with such low Z, uh, Z number are uh, used in these uh, scenarios, uh, in particular for uh, beryllium, for um, the plasma phasing components? Okay, um, you have you have the following issue. If you have the machine and you have 150 cubic meter of vacuum and the machine is at, let's say, 80 degrees C wall temperature, you will have a lot of water inside. And then you have to get it out. So what you do first with the water, you start to do baking and then you pump it out. And then when you have done this for hundreds of hours, then you start to do something like plasma cleaning and you can do this by glow discharge, hydrogen glow discharge and start to remove. Or you can do some more fancy techniques. And if you've done so, you will still have a certain oxygen concentration. In present day machines, it's very critical if you have tungsten because every oxygen, if you go now to, where's the picture? If you now have uh, an impurity like oxygen present, If you have oxygen, yeah, then it is something like nitrogen. So as soon as you have something inside, it will sputter your tungsten. And then you would have tungsten polluted into the plasma, which is not very good. Moreover, the, the oxygen will do multiple cycles and it will stay inside. So if you have a percent or so, it will just kill the plasma. So the first machines, when they started to do with tungsten, this was the Princeton large Tokamak experiment. They had negative, temperature profiles because of the tungsten. And the reason was the oxygen in the machine. Now, at that time, they couldn't sort it out. So nobody used tungsten. Now, if you have beryllium, what happens? If you have beryllium, then the beryllium grabs the oxygen and it buries it. So it do, it's actually like a thin surface coverage on the first wall. So everything by an oxide on top is covered, no oxygen can be released. And if any oxygen is flying around, it can be grabbed and it's buried. And so what you take out of the machine is the oxygen is the main impurity. And therefore you will have not so much tungsten sputtering. At the same time, the beryllium is very low in Z. So it's not harming your plasma performance. And if you take this combination and you need to do some conditioning of the machine and you have something for free with the beryllium, that's something you can apply. And beryllium has a relatively high melting temperature. Uh, so it's uh, in principle a good way to operate the machine. Now in future for a reactor, you cannot use this because you would have too much uh, dust. So you have to find other ways and this might be more conditioning. In present day machines, people are using boron instead. So they have this boronization, so it's a, uh, B2H6 in helium in a glow discharge and it's deposited something like 50 nanometers and it lasts for a certain time and then it's gone. But if you would do this in a reactor, then you have to do this for every pulse. So these are only transient solutions because we are not good enough in wall conditioning, if I may so. But it's not good for a reactor. The same is also for lithium. Okay, thank you. Other questions from inside? Do you have some uh, questions outside? Not too shy. Okay. If uh, there are no additional questions, uh, I would like to thank again uh, Sebastian for this. Uh... Sorry. Uh, sorry. I would, uh, I would ask uh, if it... Uh, uh, is it possible to to listen again the, the speech to obtain a record? You have to contact me. Okay, okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Have, you can also put my name if there's a need. You can contact me or ask. This is what is uh, possible if there are questions. Okay. Other questions? If uh, there are no additional questions, uh, I would like to thank again Sebastian for this uh, nice lecture.
And uh, thanks again. Thanks, Sebastian. You're welcome. Bye. Bye bye. bye. Thanks, Sebastian. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank. Thank you. Bye.